Hello, everyone. Welcome. Sorry about the delayed start. Was trying to go through Zoom, and of course, that did not work for me. But you know how that happens, technology. So, welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Nicole Gaither. I'm an attorney who does, I do trademark law. I own my own law firm, Creativa IP Law. I'm based in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I work with clients all over the nation and even internationally to help file their U.S. trademark registrations. So welcome to Tipsy Tuesday. This is the night where uh, I give you all information about the wine for the week and also IP tips and we have fun and you ask questions, you pose questions and you know whatever question doesn't get answered today will be answered next time. So once again welcome and thank you for being here. So we will start with you know one of the most important things of the night. So let's see. I hope y'all can see. It. So this is the wine of the week. Um, it's Menage a Trois. It's the midnight uh, wine, and it is a dark red blend. Um, I like I said, I am a red wine fan. So let's see. It's a California wine. It's affordable. It's probably like less than twenty dollars. I got it from the grocery store. Let's see, experience a dark side of menage a trois with Midnight, a luxurious dark red blend, sure to satisfy your deepest desires. Voluptuous black cherry and berry flavors with hints of mocha and exotic spice play across your lips, urging you to turn out the lights and savor the pleasures of the dark. Wow, okay, well that's not gonna be happening here tonight, but you know, it is a pretty good wine. Um, I still think I do like the Apothic crush uh, more than anything. I'm not sure if I found anything to replace that. Oh, I did. There's a wine called Diablo, which I couldn't find this week. So I had it last week. So I'm going to try to see if I can find that next week. All right. So you all are here, not for me to ramble on about wine I don't have in front of me, but we are going to talk about office actions. And if you are not familiar with it, what an office action is, so let's, you know, kind of review. First of all, when you're, you know, you're going through the process, you're going to file a trademark application, you go ahead, get the application drafted, and you file it with USPTO. You pay your fees, of course, and it gets filed. So almost the majority of applications that are filed, um, it's kind of a question about what number it is. So it could be like 60%, I've heard 85%. The majority of applications that are filed, you know, through the USPTO, get an initial refusal. And that initial refusal is called an office action. It's basically a letter from the trademark examiner who has reviewed your application and has questions or something needs to be clarified or you can't move forward in the application process until you, you know, explain what's going on with this application. However, so they're not final. Um, like you get, I think it's gonna be three. So you get a first, refusal and you have to respond to it within six months. If you give a response, hopefully you answer the questions that the examiner was looking for you to answer, you resolve the issues, you move forward. However, if you don't answer the questions or if you don't answer all of them to the examiner's um, liking, or if they even find new stuff, they'll issue a second uh, office action. Um, so again, you're given six months to respond to that. And then if that still doesn't go the way, you know, they like it or want it to be, you'll get a final one. And if you are at the final stage and you are unable to resolve it, all the arguments you've made, you have the option of either just letting the uh, application go, just you know, saying, okay, that's it, we're not gonna get this one approved, or you can go even her, fi, her, excuse me, higher, and you can go to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. It's the TTAB. It's kinda like a court for trademarks. So, oh, hold on, I got a problem, let's see. Okay, I think I'm live. I don't know, because I just got an error message. So I think I am with you all. But we will find out the hard way in a second. Um, so like I was saying, it's kind of like a court, but it's really almost paper-based, but there are hearings um, you know, that go on, and they go on at the USPTO uh, office in Virginia. Okay, so let's see. The office actions that you get could be either substantive or non-substantive, and it could be as simple as just disclaiming a word that's in your application. So that would be like just basically saying that you don't have the exclusive right to use this word. However, it's still a part of your trademark. 
For example, like let's say you're trying to, you know, register Sir Barkalot's pet store. So you cannot, you have to disclaim pet store because it's, you know, you're, you're unless you are doing something else, you are, you know, selling supplies at a pet store. And, but you can't keep the, you can't have the exclusive right to prevent other people from using that term for, you know, what they're doing. So you, you know, your mark is going to be Sir Barcelot Pet Store, but you just have to disclaim the pet store part of it. Um, you can get some where they just ask you to change around the wording in your services description where, like, they just want you to do a better job of explaining it. Uh, and they don't even give you what they're looking for. It's like, here's what you should have. And that's what you respond with. You know, it's simple piece of cake. Like, don't make it as difficult as, as possible. Um, it could be like providing a specimen, which is basically providing evidence of you using the mark. That would be, you know, like, a, you know, your website, like a screenshot of your website. It could be marketing materials. Just anywhere where the mark is being used in association with the goods or services that you filed your application under. The biggest one that most people get is uh, because they did not present something that's showing their, their mark in use. Like they have something that's just not even related to it. Or, you know, the, the, like I said, the biggest one is T-shirts. You know, when you're filing an application and you, you know, have T-shirts and that's what your mark is going to be, you, you can't, I mean, it, even though you're probably going to have that name on the T-shirt, you can't just present that to be your evidence of the mark in use. That does not provide the source of the T-shirt. That just is almost a decoration or a graphic. So you have to provide, you know, a hang tag with your, your mark on it to basically say, like, this is the store that sells this. Or, you know, also, like, the back of your shirt is going to have, like, the, you know, your brand name, business name. Uh, and I have something else for that. Let's see. Yeah, like, not showing where the trademark is used in connection with the goods or services that you applied for. And, you know, the fix could be really just providing another specimen like one that actually answers the questions. Okay, so those are kind of the simple ones. Like it doesn't really take a lot to answer those. There are the substantive ones, which is why, you know, a lot of people, you know, go through an attorney to do this because these are things that most attorneys are familiar with. They know how to avoid them within the application phase. Like, for example, I always, you know, part of my process is to do a comprehensive clearance search, which, you know, it's more than just looking at the USPTO website. It's looking at state registries of uh, trademarks. It's looking at domain names, social media pages, business, uh, you know, Secretary of State sites for businesses, you know, websites, anything where there might be something that could be similar to the mark, you know, based on sound, spelling, uh, like it could be a translation, anything where this mark might be, you know, cause confusion for someone else, you know, for uh, one of your customers. So sustainable mark, you know, sustainable refusal is basically just, you know, it's you, you know, got to do some stuff or else your application is not even going to make it through. The most popular one is the likelihood of confusion. Hi, Tanika. So, like I said, the most uh, most common one that we see is the likelihood of confusion. And this is sometimes, you know, when someone files their application on their own, or they might use, a, you know, another, like, I'm going to use LegalZoom. They don't really look and do a very thorough search. So there's a possibility that they did not catch something that was, you know, out there and just they didn't do the, the full search because going through the USPTO website does not give you the full search. It's just looking at exact names. So, I mean, and it's like to confusion is basically like the trademark office is looking at marks that might cause confusion. So if the general public, you know, is looking at your product and comparing it to somebody else's and they can't figure out who the source of the product, you know, like who's providing the product and it's like, okay, well, I see it looks like this one and then that one like has a name similar to that, you know, that's what they're trying to prevent. But there are arguments that can be made. Um, this is why an attorney should be involved because, you know, attorneys are familiar with the case law. Oh, yeah. Of course, I'm, you know, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Thanks, Tanika, that'd be great. Um, so attorneys are familiar with the case law that needs to be given, you know, provided to, you know, overcome the, that, that refusal. They know also the arguments that need to be made, whatever evidence needs to be presented. And of course, you know, they are going to put together pretty much what's 
like almost a legal brief to respond to that refusal. But it's really not that simple and it could take a little while to get all of that stuff together. And it's not like something that a lay person is going to know unless you have a legal background and are familiar with all the, the laws and you know things that are involved that you know need to overcome that you know application refusal. Because if you did, I guess you would actually know that and that wouldn't have happened in the application. But you know, there are no guarantees in the process. Uh, another one that is pretty uh, big is descriptiveness. So, you know, like your basically your trademark does not, you know, give enough, it's not like unique enough. It's just basically a description of the goods and services that you provide. For example, like if you're selling apples, calling your apples red, sunny red, sunny red delight apples is, you know, could be considered descriptive because, you know, you're basically using red and that's a descriptive, you know, word for apples. So that's, you know, something that you might not really be able to overcome because if your mark is descriptive, the only way you're going to be able to overcome that is if you have acquired what's called distinctiveness. So that means that if you've been in business for a while, your customers are familiar with their brand, like they know it's, they're, not, they're not going to confuse it with somebody else's. <laughs> then you have, oh, I'm sorry, that is my dog <laughs> barking. So I'm not sure what he's looking at. <laughs> hey, Lennox. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, you know, that's life. Um, so, like, Best Buy is an example of a mark that is basically descriptive. And because it, it had been in business for a while before they applied for their trademark registration, it, you know, they were able to get through making the argument that they had acquired distinctiveness in their, you know, for their mark. What else is there? So, that's pretty much, uh, those are kind of like the more popular office actions. I don't know if anybody has seen some other ones that they want to ask about or that, you know, they're familiar with, but those are the ones that we generally see when we are doing, um, you know, reviews or like I sometimes will get a, you know, a potential client will contact me because they file their own application or they fight, you know, use legal zoom and they now have received this office action and they don't even understand what it's saying because it's usually in, legalese mumble jumbo that it takes you a couple of times and even attorneys sometimes have to be like I don't even know what you're asking me to do you know it takes a little while and maybe like you know being familiar with it for you to understand what exactly the examiner is looking for sometimes I actually get an office action on purpose I know that's crazy but you know sometimes it's just because you know I have a client who can only afford to pay for one class at the time of filing and so I might combine and put like multiple things and this is allowed by the trademark office I was talking about this last week so I will put you know all the things that the client does and then they you know the trademark office will tell me like this is not you know these are not in this class you need to you know pay for another class and that's when we'll make the payment for it also when I'm doing a registration for a logo because it's really difficult to kind of describe a logo and put it in all of the terms and you know the descriptors that they're looking for I allow them to give me the description it's because it's going to be the one that they're going to be looking for. So that is uh, kind of the reasons why I will actually allow myself to get an office action because I know it's going to be something that it's going to be very simple to, to answer. So uh, welcome all of you all who are joining me. So if you have any questions, feel free. But if you do not, you know, you can direct message me. You can also, you know, post a comment here. You can contact me via my website. It's creativaiplaw.com. You can hit me up on Facebook. I'm on Instagram at creative at creativa IP law. I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not there a lot, but it's at law creativa. And you can email me, Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, at creativaiplaw.com. So I hope you all have enjoyed tonight's Tipsy Tuesday. I hope you got something out of it and you know, I will see you all next Tuesday. Okay. Thanks for joining. All right. Bye.